Rolex still makes perfectly capable uh, tool watches and taking this diving or, or doing anything with it is still perfectly viable. Even though the Rolex name has maybe a little more baggage these days when it comes to kind of living in both of these worlds. It's a tool watch, but it's really kind of a, like a luxury item. doesn't mean you have to use it as such. But that said, the simplicity and the uh, kind of true tool watch approach to a brand like Tudor that they're doing right now does kind of feel like it's picking up the spirit of what Rolex was doing. So, you know, where the watches they that they were making seemed to have more of a clear, concise vision of what they were and wanted to be. Hey y'all, it's Thomas Hendricks with Corner 24 and today we are sitting down with Blake Bettner. Blake is a Hodiki alum, a worn and wound alum, and he's just started an exciting new venture with the D-Track. Blake, what can you tell me about that? Well, first off, thanks for having me. It's a huge treat to be here. Uh, the D-Track is really my way of exploring the world of watches and beyond through people, trends, culture, and most importantly, maybe experiences. Uh, so, uh, and it does go beyond uh, watches. We get into diving, adventure, food, wine, uh, all that kind of stuff. So uh, it's really enthusiast spaces that I'm curious about exploring. We have a link below if you want to check out more of that. But for now, Blake, we have a table full of watches. You're a tool watch fanatic, and you've done something that a lot of people in our hobby are curious about, but maybe don't know how to get into. You fairly recently got your professional dive certification, right? That's true. I, I got my open water dive certification uh, last year and have been trying to take advantage of it as best I can. Uh, I've gone diving in some pretty interesting places already. This was not based in my desire to go learn how to dive. It was based in my desire to want to <laughs> use my dive watches uh, for their intended purposes and get that kind of an experience in them, which is a little bit different than just kicking around New York uh, with a tool watch. Yeah, exactly. I want to start with a more open-ended question, which is from your perspective before you got certified to now, kind of how has your perspective of dive watches changed? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I've been a huge dive watch fan for, for a long time. And in my mind, the qualities that make a great dive watch also make for a great everyday tool watch. And mm. uh, you know, we hear this go anywhere, do anything term kind of thrown around a lot today. Can lead to some maybe slightly generic watches, but in, in my opinion, the qualities that make a great dive watch, uh, like great legibility through high contrast styles, easy to use, something really simple, also make a great kind of everyday tool watch companion. Obviously, there's more to it than that uh, mm -hmm. when you're underwater and uh, being underwater can change how some of these watches look and uh, how you use them. Uh, obviously, how you even engage the bezel or, or how legible the dial is. And all those things really do change at depth. So, for example, we have two Tudor Pelagos watches here, which are, I would say, 90% the same, but those differences are amplified underwater, let's say. What are some of those differences? The Plagos 39 uh, and the, the FXD here, I think both make ostensibly great dive watches and great tool watches all around. The Tudor Plagos 39 is better suited for kind of life on, on, on land, on dry land, for and walking why, around why every day. Yeah. So I think the, the small size, the smaller form factor, it's a little bit more comfortable to wear around uh, every single day. And the legibility is just fine uh, in, in normal light, in normal atmospheric conditions. Underwater, uh, the depth of the dial underneath the crystal is just a little bit more than the, the than the Pelago. So water kind of accentuates that that distance between those two. So, you know, on the Pelagos 39, the dial kind of appears like it's set a little bit further back mm -hmm. and being just a bit smaller in the exhibition window here, it does affect how you can read it kind of at a glance. But the Pelagos uh, FXD, especially this black one, has just exceptional legibility and the uh, the Rayhaut has been cut uh, uh, in its thickness from the original uh, Pelagos watches. So it really brings the dial, it looks like it's just right under the crystal. Yeah, even there. at this angle specifically, not the way you're holding it, it is very, it's it's as thin as can be, basically. Yeah, it's been, and it doesn't even look like there's a crystal there at, mm -hmm. at some angles. So this this really makes for a much easier watch to use underwater. It's a slightly similar story here with the Zin uh, U50, which has, an, of course, exceptionally legible uh, dial, uh, but it too is set just a little bit deeper into there. So uh, so that's why, spoiler alert, the FXD here uh, has really become my <laughs> the watch that I almost always go uh, diving in. So that's you know for those reasons, I feel like watches like this uh, perform a little bit better for for, for me. Uh, particularly, the, there's another one over here that's uh, the Marine Nationale, the blue one. Yeah. Uh, so what I like about this one, um, of course, the, the, the fixed lug form factor, can I just say, is I absolutely love. And I would love to see more brands produce dive Why? watches Why with is that? fixed lugs. Because we talked before, cameras, about your Explorer and the drilled lugs and the... 
functionality that, and this is, of course, the opposite. Yeah, so this can only accept, obviously, pass-through uh, fabric straps. So it puts the watch into this sort of funky territory. Like I said, it's kind of about the experience. Uh, so it makes these watches truly unique uh, in my experience. But I love the Marine Nationale for its bi-directional bezel. Um, this is a this is a countdown bezel uh, mm. rather than an elapsed time bezel like we're used to. I have never personally encountered an issue where I'm accidentally turning a bezel underwater. If I knock it on something, it's generally not. Yeah, because that's the itself. concern, obviously. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah, and some watches take that to like extreme lengths, right? Yes. To, we'll, to which we'll get that. to in a second. Yeah. So, but this one, you know, I mean, it, it just takes a good pull, and the and the, uh, uh, the resistance and the accessibility of the bezels on these watches is just fantastic. They're really easy to use um, underwater. Yeah, like you said divers can get a little conventional or a little generic sometimes and this is like a nice way to switch it up. Yeah. One comparison I would love to get your opinion on is a lot of people say modern day Tudor is what Rolex used to be and we have a sub here as well. I want to get your thoughts on kind of the brand trajectory of Rolex as far as tool watch versus luxury symbol status symbol things like that as someone who owns both and wears both and mm -hmm. has gone hands-on with both what's your feeling on kind of where those brands fall so i know that there is a conception out there that, that falls along those lines which i which i can certainly appreciate and i can certainly understand where people are coming from and i think there is a bit of truth into that fundamentally however i usually tell people watches are what you make of them and mm. rolex still makes perfectly capable uh, tool watches and taking this diving or, or doing anything with it is still perfectly viable. You know, it's still a tough as nails like tool watch at the end of the day. Uh, even though the Rolex name has uh, maybe a little more baggage these days when it comes to kind of living in both of these worlds, it's a tool watch, but it's really kind of like a luxury item slash status symbol. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean you have to use it as such. But that said, the simplicity and the uh, kind of true tool watch approach to something to, to, to a brand like Tudor that they're doing right now does kind of feel like it's picking up the spirit mm -hmm. of what Rolex was doing in the 60s, 60s, 70s, 80s, even 90s, you know, where the watches they, that they were making seemed to have more of a clear, concise vision of what they were and wanted to be. The Tudor watches, such as the, the Pelagos, they're you know, there's, there's no polished surfaces anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no pretension about any of it. Um, there's no added complexity there. It really feels like everything that they've done to this watch and everything that appears on this watch is there for a reason. And of course, that's traditionally, I think, how a lot of people like to think about Rolex as two watches. So, you know, th that's kind of what appeals uh, uh, about these watches to, to me personally. Uh, you know, I'd love to see Rolex make a, a fully brushed titanium yeah, Submariner or yeah, something. Which, I think that'd I be mean, fantastic. They have been moving more into titanium. I guess my next question is like, if you had to predict a little bit in the next year, two years, five years, like where do you see Tudor going? Where do you see Rolex going? So, uh, you know, the fact that they've introduced titanium, the RLX titanium at all, uh, you know, tells me that it will probably slowly get rolled out into other collections. There are there are two areas that I think would make the most sense in, and that would be something like a Sea Dweller, mm -hmm. uh, and then the other one would be the modern uh, Explorer 2. I feel like that's a platform that would make a lot of sense in titanium. And for anyone that's looking for or hoping for a titanium Submariner, and that's, that's basically this, Pelagos 39. Uh, it's, it's a great everyday watch to wear. It wears, honestly, a lot not like a five-digit uh, Submariner, like a mm. 14060, uh, it has a lot of similarities to it. So, you know, if, if you like that era of Rolex and that's the kind of quality that you're looking for, it, you know, Tudor is pretty much doing exactly what what you would expect. So, looking across the table here, one that I'm curious about is this Seiko as well. It's definitely where a lot of people start in dive watches, in tool watches. What can you tell me about this one? Anybody who has a penchant for dive watches, I think, probably has at least a few Seiko divers somewhere uh, and, and has a history with like the 7002 or the SKX007. Yeah. This is an SPB317 uh, that was just released the other year. This, to me, kind of hits all the sweet spots of a great Seiko diver, uh, kind of in, in modern form. This is uh, using the 6R35 uh, movement. Um, it's got the case that kind of falls somewhere between their skin divers and their uh, Willard case uh, a little bit. So this one is, is more kind of like a sentiment thing to me. One of the first dive watches I ever got was a Seiko 7002, mm -hmm. uh, which, which I still have uh, and, and still wear frequently. It's one of those that you had to kind of shake it to, you can't wind it or anything. It's an automatic, you just have to, yeah, <laughs> I it's, hope it's good it's enough for the day. It's got a lot of miles on it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Uh, so this one I think brings a lot of the qualities that I love about that watch into a slightly more modern um, like Seiko form. And I think these are like fantastic tool watches and, and dive watches in every right is, is just as much as they always have been. So even if you enjoy and, and, and use and rock watches a little bit further up the chain, the food chain, there, there's still something really special about using uh, these Seiko tool watches and dive watches uh, that kind of 
is a good reminder of what brought us into this hobby in the first place, what kind of experiences we were looking for, what the appeal of these things were in the first place. It's everything you need in a dive watch and nothing you don't really. It's like the yeah. essential things kind of boiled down and obviously we could talk for ages about the value that they bring. Um, you know, for people who do get in, you know, do go up the food chain, those are always there as like little impulse buys, let's say, but it's also probably the best starting point for two watches and has been for a long time. Yeah. And I think a natural progression is people start with Seiko and then they move on to something like this to Omega, which is a great watch, but also not one you hear about a lot. I feel like those kind of, I'll call them mid-range, mm -hmm. um, often get forgotten. What is this watch and how does it fit into your collection? So this one is another great kind of nostalgia uh, hit. For, for me, this is the Generation 1 um, Seamaster 300 that is from the early 2000s. This is a 2231.50. This is a titanium Seamaster 300. It wears exceptionally well. Yeah. This is kind of a reminder of the roots of the Seamaster 300. But the modern Seamaster 300 is especially watch to a lot of people for of course its appearance in, in bond movies and things mm -hmm. like that and it's it's maybe the first like proper watch a nice watch that a lot of people buy you know I, I love the first generation Seamaster 300 because the the helium release valve is a little bit smaller and, and more over the side mm -hmm. and uh, another fun factor as well for for a tool watch exactly exactly and it's just that right mm -hmm. it's a fun I'm not a saturation dive or anything like that <laughs> yeah. I'm not doing anything where I'm getting anywhere near where helium it's coming into the uh, into the case. So this kind of hits that sweet spot where I think a lot of brands were at their peak and making really cool tool watches in the late 90s and early 2000s. So it hits a little bit different than their modern versions, which again kind of skew into the, you know, there's some polished surfaces here. This feels like a nice watch. There's a ceramic dial and uh, you, know, you could dress this up a little bit. You know, this still has that kind of like no nonsense, no fuss kind of vibe yeah, about it. Yeah, fully brushed everything. And, and speaking of Omega and speaking of Fun details. The funkiest watch that we have on the table is the one here on the far right. So this is the uh, the Seamaster Plo Prof, uh, twelve hundred meters. So when you A talk about overkill, big daddy. Yes, watch. exactly. So uh, so Omega developed this in in, in the late sixties um, uh, with the help of uh, the same guy that founded Aquastar, uh, mm. and and the, a lot of the testing on prototypes of this watch were done uh, with Comex uh, divers through their their Janus projects. Uh, and this was before Comex had a relationship with, with Rolex. So this is kind of the ultimate fruit of that relationship. And it's interesting at a glance because it's so different from everything else. Now, even those Comex divers found the watch to be maybe a little bit overkill in, in some of the features that were It's a good word for it, yeah. And, and, and obviously it still is. And back then it was only 600 uh, meters, you know, which is still like massive uh, amounts these days. Yeah. But obviously it's, it's, it's weird and funky because it's got the button that you have to press to release the bezel. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's very fun uh, to use and it's a great experience. So it is much lighter than you would think. It is. It's still a bit of a chunk, but it's much lighter than the steel it's version, chunky, yeah. uh, of course. So uh, this this watch, it, it's it's still got the kind of crazy crown guard and the the shape over here for the button. So. It has this whole appendage situation over here to the left. And <clears throat> conceptually, when this watch was, was designed, it was a monoblock case. Mm. Uh, you know, the thinking being that if, if helium couldn't get into the case, then they wouldn't have to design something into the case to let it out. Right. Uh, so there was no helium release valve. When they brought the watch back in 2009, it moved away from the monoblock case, unfortunately, and it did add a helium release valve. This titanium version they introduced in 2016. In this one, uh, they also uh, have a helium release valve and it has an exhibition case back. Just last year, the 75th anniversary of Seamaster, they brought the uh, monoblock case back, which I'm really happy to see, but they still put a helium release valve on it. I don't know why they did that. You know? I think the question that a lot of people have is how does this wear? How does a watch like this fit on the wrist? And what's your experience been with it? So obviously it's a lot of watch. You can't be concerned with things like, is this going to slip under my cuff? Or, you know, can, can I address it? It's not. Yeah. All that just throw <laughs> out the window. Like, it's just not gonna be that. And you shouldn't be thinking of it for, for that. Um, it is a fun watch to wear though. And because it doesn't have a traditional lug design, mm. uh, the, the lug to lug length is, is only like 40, only, it's, only, it's only like 47 millimeters. So, so which it actually, is about the same as the Samaritan. Yeah, which is not bad. So it fits within the confines of the wrist yep. just fine. It just sits up a little high. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it's got all these bits and, and bobs. Yeah, I don't know if this is a watch that's going to be a great everyday to watch companion, but it's a great experience. We have some non-divers to get to, but I want to ask um, kind of a survey question, which is which of these watches has the best bezel action in your opinion? 
the most satisfying purr as you wow um honestly I, i'll go back to probably this marine national and just because it is bi-directional which is such an unusual and unexpected feature on like a true hardcore dive watch this is of course made for the the french Navy, and it was made mm -hmm. for a specific maneuver that they do, these, these dead reckoning maneuvers that they do underwater uh, at relatively shallow depths uh, so they can time their movement in a certain direction and then uh, alter directions at a certain time, mm -hmm. time that, and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. Uh, so it has this really great uh, movement both directions, and there's like zero play in the bezel, and there's just enough of a click to give you a tactile feel. Mm -hmm. And not only does the bezel feel great, have that tactile uh, click to it, winding the watch as well has like a kind of a bump in it. You can tell you're winding it. Everything about this watch and the FXD in general has this very kind of mechanical, over-engineered feel to it. Yeah. It's very satisfying to use. And that's what I've heard. It's like when you're looking at a diver and judging a diver and going hands-on with one, where a lot of the money goes and where you can kind of tell the quality is in the bezel action, is in the crown action as well, is in those like moving mechanical parts. It's hard to get that sense in a picture or through through a video I was talking about. It. You know, it's, it's it's one of those things you feel it and you know it. Especially if, if you if you handle a lot of watches or you do it for a living, like uh, like you and I do, you you can tell really quick if if, if, if something is on point or not. And uh, Tudor does an exceptional job there. And I want to talk about uh, next up as a transition a watch with a diving bezel that is not a diver per se, and it's this Zenith Rainbow Flyback chronograph here. This is another watch from that late 90s era that I was talking about, where mm -hmm. I think tool watches were kind of hitting their their peak. Um, special for a few issues. This, this also has uh, military roots in, in that it was designed initially for uh, French aviation yep. uh, unit. Um, My historical understanding is like there was a contract for this, and then, yeah, there was a a little bit change in administration, and then the contract disappeared and Zenith was like, I, I guess we'll just sell them now, or? The Rainbow is an existing, had been an existing uh, collection of chronographs, mm -hmm. um, actually replacing the DeLuca uh, uh, in, the, in the early 90s. And the Rainbow name itself is a reference to a yacht that won the America's Cup yes. in like the 30s. <laughs> yeah, it's not because of the colors on here, which is an understandable yeah. misconception, but it's, yeah, it's actually like a, a proper noun, let's say. Yes. Why exactly they did that, I think is still slightly up for debate. I've asked people uh, at, at Zenith about this, and um, you know, there's a few theories here and there, and of course the boat being like kind of an underdog that kind of came through to win and persevered, and, you know, whatever you want to write it after. It's a cool name, and I think this watch comes with like, an incredible amount of character um, that, that you don't see a ton. Of course, Zenith brought back their pilot watch. This is a pilot watch uh, with dive watch features. Yeah, you know, I, I think the, it's unique for that reason, but it has a lot of great like just character to it. Uh, tons, you know, of, tons. of course, all the colors that that break apart the five minute segments. And I know there are monochromatic versions as well, but I I think you just kind of go all the way. You have to go all the way. You have this. to do this one. Yeah, the, the, you're right. There's a, there's a black dial version with just a full black uh, yeah. uh, bezel as well, and that one says flyback on the dial, mm. which is maybe a little bit over the top. But. Not a watch you see a lot, and not that expensive either. I know because I've thought about buying one on multiple multiple occasions. Well, I can't recommend it enough. Blake, thanks so much for coming in. It's great to get a diver's perspective on dive watches, go hands-on with these tools. I'm glad I got to see a float prop in person, and I this has definitely bumped itself up the list a little bit for me. Glad to hear it. Yeah, it's been a huge pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Check out the Deep Track for more. It is live online right now. I'm Thomas Hendricks. This is Blake Bettner. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time.